Hello and welcome to video number eight in my series of videos which are a response to an open letter to Neil deGrasse Tyson regarding the flat earth in which he asks 12 simple questions regarding the shape and nature of our earth directed at Neil deGrasse Tyson. In this video I'm going to answer the last two questions, questions 11 and 12. And the first one concerns the moon. Question 11. Why are there craters on the moon? If the moon used to be much closer to the Earth, slowly moving away from us, and it is tightly locked to the Earth so that only one side is ever visible, then why are there impact craters on the one side of the moon that is protected by the Earth? I am guessing that you will repeat the same story that the moon's gravity has been protecting the Earth by hoovering up meteors and asteroids, but shouldn't the Earth's much larger gravitational field have been gathering up these meteors and asteroids and protecting the moon? So, how... Um, so the first thing, why would, why is there impact craters on the moon. Well, why wouldn't there be? This idea that the Earth is protected from impacts by the moon. Um, I've done a bit of reading around online. I can't find any uh, scientist who says this. If anyone's watching this who knows a lot about astronomy, perhaps you could... Uh, Clear, clarify this. Is this something that scientists say? I don't have any, uh, I can't find any evidence that they do. And to be honest, like, once I actually agree with D. Murphy 25, it, it doesn't really make sense. If you could argue that the moon protects the earth, you could argue that the earth protects the moon. In fact, you would expect that it could protect the moon more. It's bigger and it's got a stronger gravitational field. So, the question is, who actually says this? That the moon is, has protected the Earth from impacts? Well, the one place I could find it being said in an article, um, you, you can find it discussed in forums, but not in any actual article, but apart from this, which is an argument for intelligent design. And it says, the moon is completely covered with craters on top of craters while craters on the Earth are very sparse. We can determine the age of the Earth and the Moon by dust. As the Moon circles the Earth, it acts as a huge space vacuum cleaner, sweeping back and forth across the elliptic and attracting almost every comet, meteor shower or asteroid that would hit the Earth if the Moon did not exist exactly where it is. The Moon is our lifesaver by intelligent design. So this is an argument about intelligent design, that the moon must have been put there by an intelligent mind to protect the Earth. Why this creator mind didn't just create a universe in which there aren't any comets or asteroids to threaten the Earth, they don't say. But anyway, it seems to be based on this idea that there are lots of craters on the moon, but there's not as many on the Earth. Well, you wouldn't see them on the Earth. Most of this, um, most of these craters on the moon were created a very long time ago during what's called the late heavy bombardment period, which is thought to have occurred 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago. It says here, during this interval, a disproportionately large number of asteroids apparently collided with early terrestrial planets. So both the Earth and the Moon would have been heavily bombarded during this period. So why do we see it on the Moon? Why do we not see it on Earth? Well, the Moon is largely an inactive um, body. It doesn't have a... It has no atmosphere to speak of. Um, it's geologically inactive. If something hits it, and creates an impact crater, that impact crater will just stay there. Whereas the Earth is a very dynamic, active planet, geologically active, it has an atmosphere. The atmosphere would have also protected the Earth. 70% of it is covered in water. 
So a lot of these impacts will be covered in water now. The ones on land will have been covered over by wind erosion, geological activity, and also life. Life itself shapes the surface of the earth to, great, to a great extent. So all of these will have been covered over on the earth, all the impact. That's why we don't see them. And we see them on the moon because the moon doesn't isn't very active. It just If you hit it with something, it just stays that way indefinitely. Um, so it just it seems to be a completely bogus argument to start with because nobody no scientist actually says this and it doesn't really make sense. Uh, so anyway, let's go on. Are comets, meteors and asteroids able to pass through the Earth or avoid the Earth's gravity to be able to hit the face of the moon that's shielded by the Earth? So he's used this diagram here as the basis of his argument that there's no way something coming from outside the Earth-Moon system could hit the moon on the side that faces the Earth. This is it. This art, this diagram. And you would have to solve the equations, the gravitational equations for the Earth-Moon system and show that there is no possible incoming trajectory for an object in which it could hit that side of the moon. So until he actually does that, which I don't imagine he's going to be doing anytime soon, then he really has nothing at all except a silly di diagram and a bad argument that no one says anyway. So just uh, more nonsense. All right. So let's go on to the next question. And finally, question number 12. Thank goodness. Why don't you find permanent hills, mountains and valleys in the ocean? The Earth is not a smooth ball, nor is it perfectly spherical. There are huge geological features such as the Mariana Trench and undersea mountain ranges. In fact, by some accounts, the Earth without the oceans actually looks like this. We observe water behaving like this and like this, but you say it behaves like this. So why doesn't it behave like this? Um, this is just ignorance about the behaviour of water. For a start, nobody says that the that water follows the shape of the, the physical earth. That's not what's going on. Now, I've already made a video about this, so you can watch it if you want, but I'll go through the main points of why water behaves like this. In a situation where water is like this, in the water, there will be a pressure gradient, which means the deeper you go, the more pressure there is. The reason for that is because water has weight. Weight is a force. There's a force pulling it down. We call that force gravity. And this force creates a pressure gradient. In a fluid, you could not have a pressure gradient without a force acting somehow on the, the fluid. Without any extra forces working internally, then the pressure would be the same throughout the fluid. So the fact that you've got a pressure gradient proves there's a force. Now the only variable determining the pressure is the depth. So when you go a certain depth in, under the water, the water will have a certain pressure. And like I said, it's, the, it's because the water above has weight and is pushing down. Now, the pressure is not determined by the height from the bottom of the container or the seabed or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what's below. All that matters is the depth, how far from the surface you are. That determines the pressure. Now, a horizontal surface in the water will all be the same pressure because there are no forces working horizontally. 
you can't have a pressure gradient horizontally. So any surface, any horizontal surface in the water must all be at the same depth. And because it's all at the same depth, the top of the water must have a flat horizontal surface. Now, it, it does this on a small scale because on a small scale, the gravitational field is virtually uniform. It doesn't significantly change direction over the, the length of a bath or even the length of a swimming pool. So we can take it as being uniform. Therefore, the top of the water will form a flat horizontal surface, which is at right angles to the force pushing down, which is the weight of the water, the weights pushing down. In fact, that's what defines the vertical. In a situation like this, the gravitational field would be pushing in different directions. And that's what would make the water behave like this. It doesn't follow the bottom of the, the ocean like this. That's not why it curves. It's not directly following the curvature or the shape of the Earth. It's curving because it's following changes in the direction of the gravitational field, which always points to the very centre of the Earth. And that's why it curves. Now, flat earthers have zero explanation for why water has a flat horizontal surface anyway. They've got zero explanation for why there is a pressure gradient. And yet, they present this argument and similar ones like this as if they've uncovered some massive problem with the standard understanding of it, when they've got no explanation for any of it anyway, other than to say it's the natural physics of water, which means nothing. Saying that is basically saying water behaves like this because that's what water does. That's what that argument is. I mean, if that's all science had to do, then it would have been really easy. All Isaac Newton would have had to say was the planets go around the sun in ellipses because that's what planets do. Gee, didn't you, didn't you, didn't you think of that, Copernicus and Kepler? It's really obvious when you think about it. They do that because that's what they do. That's what planets do. That's the natural physics of planets. Duh. Anyway, that's the end of <laughs> uh, answering five, sorry, 12 questions to D. Murphy 25. I thought I'd finish by having a look at the man, the myth, the legend that is D. Murphy 25. He also is known as Allegedly Dave, and you can go and visit his website here. Um, and on here, you'll find um, just about any every crackpot woo-woo idea out there on here. And he gives talks and workshops and uh, about cancer. Apparently, conspiracy theorists are always telling us that cancer is really easy to cure. And, well... Show us that it is. I mean, I'd be delighted if you could show me that. I'd be absolutely delighted. I'd be the first one to shake your hand. If you could show us that cancer can be cured very easily, then do it. It's like a lot of these claims on here, or breatharianism as well. He thinks that you don't need to eat food or drink water. Um, he also, prepare yourself for this, drinks his own piss. And, uh, oh, his activism, he's a free man on the land. Uh, I think it's just another way of saying you're a selfish twat, really. Uh, money and debt, blah, blah, blah. It's all the usual stuff. And um, it's interesting what he says here. He says, I grew up in Basildon and started my working life as an animator and a graphic artist, but soon transitioned into computer programming. Hmm. Graphic artist to computer programming. That's not a well-trodden career path that I'm aware of. How do you go from being a graphic artist to being a computer programmer? I have a friend who's a computer programmer, and 
he's for one he's incredibly intelligent and also he's had to do a degree in maths a master's and is now doing a phd i mean you don't just wander into being a computer programmer you don't just walk in off the street and start com programming computers after a few years i was headhunted by a new york consultancy and before long i was working for the most prestigious and successful fortune 500 companies in the city headhunted to do what i don't know he doesn't make i mean what was he doing i joined the local fire volunteer fire department and also started my own business that i ran in my spare time right so he's been working for one of the most prestigious companies in new york which these kind of companies you'd be working 70 hour weeks i'd imagine and he started a business in his own spare time as well and and also joined the local volunteer fire department now i'm not saying this isn't true um it's just interesting shall we say so apparently he became rich and had all the, the stuff that you're supposed to want and as he says, meaningless trinket, trinkets, sorry, deep within the matrix. It's hilarious, oh, the red pill. It's hilarious how these people, they think they're so alternative and deep and challenging, and yet their point of reference is a trite Hollywood movie. I'm not, I'm not saying anything against the matrix. I love the matrix, but it's just cod philosophy. It's hilarious that they think that's them being radical. And, uh, Anyway, you can read all this stuff. He claims to have witnessed that 9-11 firsthand. Again, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that's not true. And here he is with a Ferrari. But the thing is, though, if he was a computer programmer, then he must know that what he says in that video is complete garbage. He must know that. If he believes what he says in that video, then how could he possibly have been smart enough to be a computer programmer? Which one is it? I mean, what he says in that video is nonsense. It's embarrassing nonsense. Embarrassing childish nonsense. But that's allegedly Dave for you. So, on here, there's a donate page. Um, so, if you look at your bank account and you just think, do you know what? I've just got too much money. Just far too much money. I really need to get rid of it then allegedly Dave's more than happy to take it off your hands so you can you can send him money so he can continue drinking his own piss and such like and buy some of the, buy his book here uh, so that's the end of my look at D Murphy 25's 12 questions to Neil deGrasse Tyson in summary complete nonsense every question was just nonsense and a lot of them really dishonest and I don't really I struggle to believe that this guy really believes it and um, who knows what this guy's really all about but there you go